Hi there, I'm Gideon Rose, Editor of Foreign Affairs, and welcome to another edition of Foreign Affairs Focus. Today we have the great privilege of talking to Laurie Garrett, Senior Fellow for Global Health at the Council on Foreign Relations and author, among many things, of a wonderful new article called Biology's Brave New World in Foreign Affairs recently. So Laurie, tell us, let's start, what exactly is synthetic biology? Well, synthetic biology begins with the fact that we now can sequence, therefore know the identity of an entire chain of DNA or RNA, which is the genetic material that's the basis of life. And we now have the ability to pop chunks in and out almost at will and create hodgepodges of genetic material that can perform whatever function we want. And if you combine that with other advances in cellular biology, we can actually pop genetic material in and out of given cells and then the whole creature behaves according to new instructions and does things that it previously never did in natural evolution. So we can now code creatures the way we can code uh, programs? Well, yes, but just very simple creatures right now. Uh, One-celled little simple things. But we're clearly building towards more and more complex. And if you combine this with what's coming from the other end, genetic modified foods, genetic modified seeds and crops, and then a number of other innovations that are underway, unfolding at the same time, you can see the trajectory we're on. So what are the potential upsides of all this new uh, technology? A lot of fantastic things. I mean, I, I think that probably the most exciting is the possibility of taking care of certain human health problems that are now either insurmountable or so expensive that they're only affordable and available to a small elite of the planetary population you know, some Americans, some Western Europeans, some Japanese. Uh, that would be things like certain kinds of tissue transplants, um, certain types of uh, gene modifications that could make a, a huge difference. But a lot of very exciting things are already unfolding with synthetic biology. Um, kids have made, and I say kids meaning teenagers, in um, synthetic bio competitions have made things like uh, altered an organism so that it f gives off a fluorescent green color if there's uh, arsenic in the water. So it's a cheap, instant way to you know, go to a drinking water supply, throw some water in, shake, whoa, it turned green, can't drink that. Uh, and there are a number of other things along those lines where we already see the innovation. So there are upsides to this kind of research, but in the article you talk about gain-of-function research, which also seems to have some potential downsides as well. What are some of those kinds of downsides? Some pretty serious downsides, because the whole point of gain-of-function is um, scientists want to know why in nature are there circulating organisms, pathogens, that only go to a certain species of animals, for example, um, rarely infect humans, but when they do infect humans are very, very dangerous. Um, why don't they infect humans and spread from human to human more often? So, well, if you want to understand why, perhaps you should just deliberately make an organism that does. So we now see experiments being performed where you alter the genes with the intention of basically designing a potential epidemic strain. So the same kind of research that allows you to understand the disease and possibly treat it also allows you to say to create a biological weapon. Exactly. Wow, well certainly something with this kind of massive potential implications for both harm and help is being regulated by government or international bodies and so forth, right? There's a lot of, must be a lot of people paying attention to what's going on in this new area and how to channel it for good ends and prevent the bad ends, right? Outside the United States and possibly Western Europe, no. So all this stuff is happening and nobody knows who's doing what, how it's regulated, and what's going to happen. We have absolutely no uniformity of even the definitions associated with these problems, much less regulation across Europe, within Europe, between European countries. For example, some people would say, well, if you're going to do, say, alter flu and make a man-made 
deadly, deadly influenza. You should do it only in a what's called biosafety level four laboratory. You know, like you see in the movies where the guys are in the spacesuits. You know, one of those. Uh, but nobody, no country in Europe has a definition of what constitutes a biosafety level four lab versus a less secure lab. From between Greece and Italy and France and Germany, they don't agree. So if within the EU, they can't agree. You can imagine what it means to talk about a global understanding of the problem or a global understanding of what to do to regulate the problem. When we got all alarmed in, in the West about two experiments uh, that were done on the H5N1 bird flu virus, making it more dangerous, um, the Chinese response was to turn around and make 127 versions of that virus. <laughs> so your great disease might be uh, uh, being cured by this, and there might be some uh, Walter White in a basement somewhere uh, making uh, new bad creatures rather than meth in a few years. Well, and, and we do see some scientists saying, you know, there are some places I don't want to go further. And uh, for example, recently, a team dis in California discovered that babies were dying of a new kind of bacterial infection. And it turned out to be a naturally evolved mutation where this bacteria produced what we call botulism, the botulinum toxin in these babies and killed them. They did the genetic analysis. They found where this crazy gene is that's never been seen before in this species of bacteria and determined what its sequence was and then made a decision, you know what, we shouldn't publish that. We shouldn't let the world know how to this make is how to make toxin. the worst botulism toxin. Well, this sounds like it's going to be something we'll all have to keep a lot closer eye on uh, in the future. Uh, and we're delighted you were able to uh, write about it in our pages. And uh, I recommend that you all read the piece and follow the subject in the future. Thank you very much, Lori. Thank you.